Good morning, good morning. How are you this morning? Great. Great? That's good. You're doing great. All right. So let's consider the subject that uh, we're going to be uh, studying the men everyone avoided. Okay. Sometimes you have been avoided by people, right? Because they probably owe you money and they don't want to see you. They will avoid you. You call him and I oh, you know I, I know what he wants or what she wants. She wants me to pay back what I and things like that. Sometimes a person is avoided because uh, you know that that person is gonna get you in trouble with gossip, and you say no, 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 no. I don't want to talk to that person because it's gonna bring gossip, and then he's going to involve me in his or her gossip. So I, I rather just avoid this person. Okay, and sometimes you avoid a person because of the bitterness in his his or her life, and you say. That person is just complaining about everything, and uh, so I just just gonna avoid having a conversation with a, such a negative person. Okay, that uh, everything he or she wants to talk about is about negative things, negative things about people, and and this. And so uh, we try to avoid by for different reasons. Okay, but in this case. Uh, the man was avoided by everyone, by everyone, <laughs> not just by some, but everyone avoided this person. And we're going to look, we're going to see why he was avoided. So open your Bibles, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, Luke, chapter 8, and um, we're going to learn why he was Avoid it, okay? Uh, there's a reason for, and I'm pretty sure you, you would do the same, okay? You would do the same. You would uh, avoid this kind, this type of person. <clears throat> Luke chapter 8, you have it there? We're going to begin on verse 26. Verse 26, you found it? All right, I'm going to begin reading. It says, They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot, he kept under guard. He had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let him go into the pigs. And he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the men, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those standing the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed 
and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. Let us pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this story that you made sure that we were going to know about your power, about your mercy, about your authority. And Lord, help us to understand the lessons, the lessons that, that can be for us. Thank you, Lord, because we know that your word is so that we can get to know you exactly who you are, to know about your power, about your grace, about your mercy. So show us in this story, Lord, everything about you and everything about us. In Jesus' name we pray and for his honor and glory. Amen. Amen. All right. So here we have um, this demon power controlling this town of Gadara. Everybody was afraid of this person. Okay. They, they tried to control him, but they just couldn't control him. The Bible tells us that see, many times the demons had seized him, and, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. So, see, we have to see and understand the reality of evil because more and more our society here in the United States, they don't believe in the real, literal existence of Satan, of evil, of demons. They say, oh, come on, that's... That's for the past when, when they, were, they were not educated. They, they were not really uh, knowledgeable of all the uh, medical advances that we have nowadays, that they thought it was a demon-possessed person. But in reality, it was a, a, a mental health issue. It was not demon possession. That's what liberals tell us. Uh, even if, if they are pastors and, and teaching, they say, oh, we have another example of a misconception of what really happened to this man. He was, uh, he, he needed medical attention, but this, and they explain it away, the reality of Satan, demons, and evil, and um, they don't want to believe what the Bible tells us that is true, that, that we should believe in the presence of, of evil if it because if we believe if we have the conviction that Jesus is God then he wouldn't be telling us lies about Satan he wouldn't be telling us uh, that is a real entity, a real person, a re that evil is real, that Satan is real, demons are real. Right. If he was God, he wouldn't be lying to us. On the contrary, he would tell us, you know what, uh, don't believe that, because many times he, he told us, he told the people, hey, don't believe what the Pharisees are telling you. That's not according to the law. That's their own interpretations and, and their traditions, but it's not right. He did that. 
But when it came to demons, he never said, yeah, come on. There's no such thing as evil spirits and demons. No. It is real. It is real, and we have to believe that. Okay? That we have to believe that. That they are real. What does the Bible tell us? It says, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. Okay? So your friends, your relatives, your family members that don't believe in the gospel, that don't believe in Jesus, are blinded by Satan. Okay? And we have to believe that, that. That's what the Bible tells us. They are blinded. Satan, he, he just put a, a blinder. So they won't see the glory of God. They won't see the grace of God. So that they won't see their condition, their sinfulness. They, they cannot see that they're on their way to hell. No, and that's the work of Satan. Blinding the minds, the Bible tells us. I was blinded for many, many, many years until Jesus came and uh, I was able to, to see Okay, now uh, it says here, the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world, he is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. So you see, Satan is not omniscient. That means that he can be uh, everywhere at the same time. That's only God. Only God is omniscient. He can be everywhere at the same time, but not Satan, okay? But he works, he is the commander of his army of, of evil spirits because Satan is just a fallen angel, okay? And when he fell, he took many, many angels with him that became demons. So now they are under his orders. And like a captain of, a, of an army, he gives orders. Go there, go to the Coachella church, go here, go do this, go there. And they obey his orders. They are obedient and they're doing his work. That's why the Apostle Paul in Ephesians, he explains that we are in a spiritual battle. And he tells us the spiritual battle, we're, we're fighting not against flesh and blood, but against unseen spirits. That's our spiritual battle that we are waging every day with unseen spirits that are working in an unseen way. We don't see it, but it's, they, they are working. They are working. Okay? So, and it says here, they're working in the hearts, in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. See, even as Christians, that we refuse to obey God, we're giving entry to Satan to do his work in us because we are being disobedient to God. Every time that we are disobedient to God, in reality, we're opening the door for Satan to come and do his work in our hearts, in our lives, in our minds. That's why it's so important, the Bible tells us about obedience. Obedience. Why do you think that it's synonymous, faith with obedience? Because it's so important to be obedient, it's as important as having faith. Amen. It's synonymous, okay? So when, when we are not obedient, we are allowing Satan to influence us. Our minds, our hearts are going to be influenced by Satan. So that's why we need to believe in his existence. We have to believe that he's real. We have to believe that he is working okay, and constantly working. Do you think they take vacations or they have day off? No, they're working 24-7, 24-7, 24-7. They're working. You see, most of my dreams that I have, that is every now and then, but most of my dreams that I have 
are dreams that I have a battle with Satan in some way or some other. So, so I believe that it's also Satan working in my mind, even if, even though I must sleep, and always Liz has to wake me up. Sergio, Sergio, wake up! <sighs> thank you, thank you. The, the, those type of dreams brings a lot of anxiousness when you're uh, experiencing there that spiritual battle. That I, I I see Satan taking one of my of my children. And he's carrying it, and I try to run, and and I and I can only run in slow motion. And then I, that anxiety that I have. <laughs> so he's real, and he's constantly working. Okay, he's constantly working. The Bible tells us. Now I want you to let me show you real fast. The way that Satan works, it's, it's, on a prog it's on a progressive way, okay? For example, we see here this man, demon-possessed. Do you think that just overnight he was demon-possessed? That he was very happily going to work and boom, he got demon-possessed? No, it was progressive, okay? It was progressive. Now, uh, one of the things that we believe here in this church, because we see it in the scriptures, that a true believer cannot be demon-possessed. Okay? A true believer cannot be demon-possessed. There are many, the majority of churches out there, they believe that, that yeah, that we can be demon-possessed. Even a, 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 a true believer can be demon-possessed, but it's a contradiction. Biblically and doctrinally, theologically, it's completely a contradiction that the Holy Spirit lives in us, and now an evil spirit lives in us. There's no such thing. When the Holy Spirit lives in you, He is greater and more powerful than He that is in the world. So He's not going to be able to possess you. Okay? He's not going to be able to possess you. But He's going to be able to do the other works that can be progressive, that it can, that progression can end up in possession. But that's only for non-believers. That last step is only for non-believers. But we can, we can experience, for example, let me show you uh, the progression. We know that we all have a sinful nature. That we, that's what we call the flesh, right? That's our sinful nature. Mm. It's a sinful nature. So, the sinful nature that we have is what Satan uses to allure us to sin, to invite us to sin, okay? And, and we know that Satan is using a system, and that's what we call the world. It's a world, a system. And the system, that world system that is contrary to the uh, morals, ethics, values of, of God, they set up situations that are inviting us to do the wrong thing, okay? to do the wrong thing. That's what the world is doing. What, that's what we call, that's why you're going to see in, in the New Testament that every time that you find the mention of the world, mm, the, the Bible is telling us, avoid the influence of the world. Avoid the influence of the world. Why? Because it's under the control of the prince of this world, Satan. It's under the control of the prince of this world. You know what's going on with our society. Right. So what do you think? Who do you think is behind everything that we don't like, that, that are happening in our schools, that are happening in government, that is happening in the laws and everything? Who do you think is behind? Evil, because it's evil to teach uh, pornography to, to kids, to little children. That's evil. To take them without the knowledge of parents to change their sex. That's evil. That's evil. Satan is behind all that, and we have to truly believe it. So... So that's the way Satan works. And now, look, this is, this is what happens. 
Then comes temptation, okay? Comes temptation. Temptation is the invitation or the attraction to do wrong. So Satan uses his system, the world. He uses different kinds of baits. You know, when you go fishing, you, you have to find out exactly what kind of fish is in that water and you have to know what kind of bait is going to be most effective for that kind of fish so that you can use. So it's going to be attractive if it is living bait or dead or artificial, whatever. Okay? But you're going to find out what's going to be more successful when you're fishing. Well, Satan knows exactly the bait that is attracted to me, the bait that is attracted to you, and he's going to be dangling there in front. Oh my goodness, that looks delicious, and nobody's going to find out, and this and that, and we start being deceived, because he is the deceiver. That's what it means, Satan, the deceiver. So now comes temptation, the invitation, come. Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Nobody's going to find out. Come. And when we bite the bait, what's, what's behind the bait? A hook. We're hooked. We're hooked. So that means that in that progression, when we are hooked, then it can become an obsession that. It can become an obsession. Now I'm obsessed. A compulsive preoccupation with a fixed idea or an unwanted feeling or emotion often accompanied by symptoms of anxiety. Nowadays, yeah, they say, oh, that person is experiencing anxiety. It's, it's a mental health issue. Yeah, I know. I, I, don't, I don't disagree that it's a, a, a mental problem, but what could be the cause? of that mental problem that is causing anxiety, what could be the spiritual cause? Because you see, sometimes we have, even us Christians, we don't understand or we don't truly believe that we are more than a body, that we're more than physical. The body tells, that the Bible tells us that we are, yeah, body, soul, and mind, right? Are you agree that that's the image of God, that we are body, soul, and mind. We are a triunity. We are a unity, body, soul, and mind. Okay? So we have to deal with our problems in those three areas. Okay? In those three areas. And, and when a person is, is having that type of compulsion, of fixed ideas, obsession with something, don't deal with that only medically, physically, emotionally, spiritually. We have to deal with the, the, the three compartments that make up my being. I have to work on those three. When a person comes to me and that, that wants uh, advice, counseling, and have something like this, I always tell them, yeah, let's work on three areas, not just one. Because if you just go to the doctor or the psychologist and you're gonna be missing the other areas and sometimes you're just gonna get worse because you're not getting better because you're not dealing with all the areas of our lives. So that's the way that, that Satan works. He's progressing, progressing, you know, attracting the flesh, Alluring the flesh, inviting the flesh, and once we are hooked, we fall into that sin, that temptation. And then, because the Bible tells us that sin is pleasurable, but it says that only for a short time. It's pleasurable for a short time. So, it's like a drug. I want more. I want more. And I want more, and that, that's when it becomes an obsession. I want more, I want more, and I want more. It becomes an obsession, obsession, obsession. Okay? And then, what happens? What's that in that progression? 
It, it can become an oppression. You see, little by little, Satan is getting closer to the possession. You see? Little by little, is he's going step by step, step by step. And if we don't really pay attention, if we don't really believe the way he operates, you know, that can happen to an unbeliever, be, end up being uh, possessed. Then comes oppression. Oppression, a sense of being weighed down in body or mind, usually resulting in depression. See, when a person is depressed, he says, I feel so tired, like I have a big burden in me. I just want to be sleeping. And in reality, I don't want to live anymore. Uh, I just want to die. And then they begin having those uh, desires of, uh, of dying committing suicide. So who do you think is behind that? Hmm? Who do you think is truly behind that? So that's why we have to work spiritually too, because Satan is working. Satan is working. So now the, pre the person that has that oppression that Satan is constantly there, 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 because the Bible tells us that he came to kill and destroy. Hmm? And that's what he wants. He wants to destroy us and kill us and take us to, to hell. That's what he wants. So we shouldn't let him do that. Okay? Now, the, the last step is possession. When now the person is under the control of an evil spirit or under the control of a passion or an idea, that the person is possessed by an idea, by a passion, or by an evil spirit, that's possession. Usually when, when a person gets into that stage of possession, little by little, the, the demon it's taking more and more control of the will of the person, of the will of the person. That's why a person that is demon-possessed can be normal for a long period of time, and suddenly they have an episode of possession. And little by little, that control is going to be greater and greater, and greater to the point like this person that we're just read in the Bible. They, they just couldn't control him at all. He was uncontrollable. No matter what, he would be under the control of Satan that he could break the chains and then he would just go wild. So we have to understand this reality of how Satan works. And we have to believe it and we have to, to, to face it with prayer. We have to face it with, with all the weapons that God has given us. See? Yeah, medical weapons, spiritual weapons. All the weapons that we have, we have to use them. Because we see this person, see, once he reached that point of possession, he wanted to be alone, isolated. So, if you have that problem that you want to be isolated, you just want to be alone, that you, you, you feel better being alone, you don't want to be in, in contact with other people, you avoid being with people, you have to be careful. It, it, it's not normal, it's not healthy. It's not according to God's will. It's not according to the Holy Spirit living and controlling your mind, controlling your emotions, controlling your will. No. There's something that is not right that is making you be isolated to prefer not to connect with people. I don't want to connect with people. I don't want to connect with people. When in reality, what's, what do you think is the nature of heaven? That we're going to be all connected as a family. Amen. We're going to be connected perfectly. Right now, it is difficult and it's impossible to connect among us perfectly. But because we cannot connect perfectly doesn't mean 
that we shouldn't connect at all. The Bible tells us that, yeah, we have to connect with one another. What's, what's the, um, the image, the imagery that we have in the New Testament about us, the church? That we are a body, okay? A body. And what happened with all the members of that body? They are interconnected. That's what the Bible teaches. We are interconnected. There's no such thing as a member of my body to want to be isolated, to be alone. I don't want to be connected. Yeah, I just want to be isolated. Every now and then I can come and just here and then shoom, isolation again. It's not healthy. It's not normal. You have to see that you have to do spiritual battle. Hmm? Because the influence is of the evil one, that he can take you to that point. And that's the point. This person is a native, night and day among the tombs and in the hills. He would cry out and cut himself with sharp stones. Twice I have counseled with young people that they were doing that. They were cutting themselves. Cutting themselves. And then like one, I remember that supposedly now, look, I'm not cutting myself, I'm not cutting myself. And then the mother found out that she was cutting where nobody was able to, to see. That she was cutting, cutting, cutting. Who do you, who do you think is behind that? Right. Hmm? They say, oh yeah, it's a, a mental health issue. Yes. But who is creating that unbalanced thinking and the way we see things and the way I see myself and the way I feel about myself. Who do you think is doing spiritual battle in your life and it's defeating you, defeating you, defeating you to the point that you do that. That's, that's what he was doing. See? He was cutting himself with sharp stones. So what, what do we see here? Something that we truly don't believe nowadays, Christians. There's a collision of two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. They are at war, war constantly, every day. But we don't see it that way. We think that, oh yeah, Jesus is my savior. I'm a Christian, I'm bound to go to heaven. So sometimes we tend to see here, like uh, I'm in a picnic. You're not in a picnic here, you're in the battleground. Right? This is not the park, this is not a picnic, it's the battleground. This is where the battle is waging, waging socially and waging in your mind, in your mind, that's the battle, the spiritual battle. And we have to understand that it's a collision of two kingdoms. And it's sad when a true believer is being overcome by the kingdom of darkness. When greater is he that lives in me than he that is in the world. Now he's overcoming me just because I'm being disobedient. That's why he's overcoming me. Because I'm being disobedient. Okay, Not because... God is not protecting me, not because it's the fault of God. No, it's my disobedience that I'm opening, opening the door for <laughs> Satan to enter and do his work. And, and he's going to take that invitation like that. He's going to take that invitation like that. Okay? So we are in a collision course. Okay? And we see here, it says here, that when he saw Jesus... He cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. So, if you evaluate the words of the demon right there, who is the demon considering the most powerful in this battle. Who is more powerful? The demon or Jesus? Jesus. Yeah. You can see that he's 
submitting to Jesus. He's acknowledging, oh, you're the son of God. You're the incarnation of God. You have the authority to even send me to, the, to, to, to hell. But don't do it. Please, don't do it. See? So greater is he, the Lord Jesus. He's greater than demons. Now, so we have here a, conf a confrontation, okay? And is Jesus confronting a demon? Yes or no? Yes? He's confronting a demon. Do you believe that? Oh, yeah. Because the Bible tells us that when Jesus asked him, see, let me show you. Jesus asked him, what is your name? Legion. He replied, because many demons had gone into him. So the word legion in those days meant 6,000 soldiers. So can you imagine the possession of that person? Maybe that's what it was, 6,000 demons. Somebody one time, a person told me, they cannot fit in, the, in, the, in a body, 6,000. How many can fit? Do you know how many can fit? No, I don't. They're spirits. They're spirits. 6,000. A legion. He was possessed by. So you see the, the danger. But we have this confrontation. One person, the Lord Jesus Christ, God himself in the flesh, against 6,000 demons. And who is more powerful? The one, Jesus. Hmm? That's why don't hesitate to use God's word, to use God's power, prayer, and everything when facing uh, an emotional problem, a psychological problem, physical problem, spiritual problem, because the Lord is powerful. You know, we have seen other examples of Jesus healing illnesses, sickness. But now, now he's healing demon possessions. Demon possessions. So, one, Jesus Christ against 6,000. And the Bible tells us that he is more powerful. Okay? He is more powerful. It says here that one defeated. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Hmm? And what happened? Did they obey or they didn't obey? They had to obey. Hmm? They had to obey. It is God ordering, ordering them. This is an order from high up, right. higher than you. The maximum authority from God. Come out. Come out. He's ordering them. Come out. Okay? And the 6,000 demons came out. It's not that, okay, uh, only 3,000 are going to come out and 3,000 are going to remain. Or uh, most of us are going to come out and, and only one is going to remain. No. All of them, they had to obey the order of Jesus Christ. Come out right now. And what, what happened? They negotiated. Say, hey, <laughs> I know that we're going to come out, but at least let us go into the pigs. At least let us go into the pigs. Because it says here that Jesus gave him permission. It says, when the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. Wow. It's because... Demons, they prefer to live in living 
creatures, living persons, hmm? living persons, it could be especially us, but at least in an animal. Hmm? And for them, there's no difference between a man and a pig. That's how they value us. Hmm? That's one of the, the, the messages that why might, maybe that's the reason why Jesus allowed them to go into the pigs. Look, they value the same as pigs. That's the way they see people like with no value. No value. Now, let me ask you a question. Did Jesus have the right to permit the legion of demons to destroy a herd of 2,000 pigs, 2,000 swine, and perhaps put the owner out of business? Because other uh, I think it's Mark, the one that tells us there were 2,000 pigs. 2,000. 2,000 for 6,000 demons. 2,000 pigs for 6,000 demons. What do you think? What is your answer to that question? Was he wrong in doing that? Was he mean and sensitive? to this business. Now, I want you to understand and, and, and to remember that this town, Gerasim, where, he, where everything is going on, it was Gentile, 100% Gentile. That means they were not Jews at all. They were pagans. They were pagans. Many of the other stories that we have covered when Jesus had healed other people, that they were mostly Jews. But here is pagans, non-Jews, garrisons. Okay? And so Jesus wanted to give them uh, uh, lessons about the value of men. Okay? The value of men. Okay? For all the animals of the forest, are mine. This is the Lord speaking. All the animals of the forest are mine, and I own the cattle on a thousand hills. And you can go on in that psalm, and the Lord God, he's presenting himself as the only owner of everything in the world, and that he can do as he wishes with what he owns. So in reality, those pigs belonged to God. He was the ultimate owner. It's like us, for example. Okay. When, when you are asked, oh, uh, you have a home? Yeah, I have a home. And uh, so who is the, the real owner of the home? Well, right now is the bank, but once I pay it, it's going to belong to the Lord 100%. <laughs> And we have to see everything that we have, hmm? everything that we have belongs to the Lord. My home, my car, my time, my checking account, my savings account, everything ultimately belongs to the Lord. Hmm? Belongs to the Lord. Because the Bible tells us when we, when we came to this world, Empty, not even, not even shorts, nothing. We were naked when we were born. And when we live this world, when we die, it's the same thing. It's going to be very expensive to get just a, a, a jacket because, you see, there's nothing here. There's only a jacket and naked. And it's very expensive. $6,000, $3,000 for a jacket, uh, for a dead person. And what about everything that you have? Properties, homes, savings accounts, this, that. Nothing you're going to be able to take. Nothing, not even a penny. Okay? So the Lord is the owner of everything. So. He, he was the owner of those pigs. He was the owner. But what happened? What was the reaction of the people? 
It wasn't good, okay? It wasn't good. Now, for Jesus, this man had more value than many pigs. For Jesus, he wanted to show them the value of men. He said, this one person is more valuable than 2,000 pigs. Yes. More valuable than 2,000 pigs. And there, were, there was a lot of money involved in 2,000 pigs in those days. That's how you can see that they were uh, Gentiles, non-Jews, because the Jews, they, they couldn't have pigs. According to the law, they just couldn't have pigs. They couldn't eat swine. But they were Gentiles, and they didn't mind, all right? Now, how would you expect those who witness the miracle to react? Just pretend that you are there in that moment and you witness, look what he did to this person that we just couldn't control him. We try to control him with chains and we are witnesses how he broke them and he went to the tombs and, and lived there worse than an animal and, and we were so afraid of him, avoiding him all the time and this and that. And now look at him. He was always constantly naked. He, he couldn't, he didn't wear any clothes. And now look at him, all dressed up and normal, speaking and behaving. How would you react to that miracle? Just think about that. Well, I'm pretty sure that you're thinking, well, I would have asked Jesus, Jesus, stay with us. We have many people that are, you know, behaving erratically, and we have many people that are sick and ill and blind, and, and we have a colony of lepers here and this and that. So stay with us, help us, help us, since you have this kind of power, help us, right? That's what I would take advantage of having a person doing that. I would take advantage. But apparently money was more important to them than mercy. And they asked Jesus to leave. Get out of here. We're losing money. We're losing money. Get out of here. And they asked Jesus to leave. Ask Jesus to leave. But then we have the reaction of the former demon-possessed man. The man from whom the demons had gone, gone out, begged to go with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town, how much Jesus had done for him. Did he obey Jesus? Yes. Right away, he obeyed Jesus. Hmm? He did what Jesus told him to do. And that's the way we should be. What Jesus, what God is telling us to do, obey him. It's for our own good, because when we don't obey, we already learn that we're opening up ourselves for the influence of the evil one. Hmm? That's why obedience is so important. It's so important, and he obeyed right away, right away, okay? And that's where we get the, the word oikos, because in the original, that's when, he, when Jesus is telling him, return home, okay? Home is the word oikos, and the word oikos in the Greek means go to your people, okay? Go to your people, and that word includes my family members, my friends, people that are, uh, that I, um, uh, that I'm in contact with at work, at school, my neighbors, go and let them, that's why he went all over town, hmm? because that was the command, go to your oikos 
And he says, well, I'm going to go all over town. That's my oikos. And I'm going to tell them about the great things that, that Jesus did for me. And that's the way that we should be doing. When we experience the deliverance from sin, that now my sins are forgiven. Jesus paid for them. I'm forgiven. I know that I'm bound to heaven. Then I'm going to tell everybody the great things that, that Jesus has done for me. Amen. I'm going to tell people around me, my oikos. I'm going to tell them about it. Hmm? Now, let's summarize what Satan and Jesus can do. Satan enslaves, Jesus liberates. Hmm? So what do you prefer? Spiritual freedom or spiritual enslavement? If you prefer spiritual freedom, obey the Lord. Hmm? Obey the Lord. That's the only way that we're going to be liberated from all our fears, all the, everything that, that we know that Satan is working against us. Satan is destructive. Jesus builds up. Hmm? So we have, we, we, we have the decision what is it that I'm going to choose to, to grow in the knowledge and in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and be built up spiritually or destructive? Just don't obey Jesus and that's what he's going to do. Hmm? Your faith, little by little, is going to be destroyed. Your trust in God, your passion for the Lord, love for the Lord, love for people are going to begin little by little. He's going to be shipping away, shipping away until it's completely destroyed. Okay? Now, Satan takes life. Jesus gives life. He takes life. The Bible tells us that that's his main goal. He wants to take our life. Why? Because he doesn't want you to get to the point of coming to know the Lord and be saved. Because now he's not going to be able to take you to hell. But as long as you don't know the Lord, he's going to be working constantly so he can take your life and take you to hell and he's going to take you to hell gladly and lastly Satan takes to hell Jesus takes to heaven Amen. so that's why, that's why it's so important for us to truly believe about the conflict of two kingdoms the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world that we know that Satan is the commander the prince of this world with his army doing battle against us. Do you believe that? Do you truly believe that? I want to hear it from you. Do you believe that? Amen. 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 Yeah. It is important always to participate, to answer, because that's the way that, that, that we grow in conviction. Okay? I said it, so you start get growing in conviction. It's very different from just believing. Conviction is when you start to be convinced, 100% convinced. So when I'm 100% convinced that this is true, then I'm going to do what is necessary because I'm convinced. But if I just let it be uh, a belief, I can take it or leave it, obey it or not believe it, or, or not do it, not obey it. I have that option with beliefs, but convictions don't have options. Convictions, the only option for a conviction is obedience, doing it. That's why conviction. Let us pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father for these lessons that we have here in the deliverance of a demon-possessed man, and that we know, Lord, 
that it's true that Satan is real and that he is commanding millions and millions of uh, demons that are really tempting us, that that's the very first thing that, that is going to happen, that we should that we should be wise to know that every temptation does not come from you. It's not from your spirit. It's not from your spirit that is evil, that we should avoid and not yield to temptation because that's the beginning of opening up to Satan's work and that he will continue in that progress help us Lord not to go to temptation to deny it, our flesh say no because we don't want to be obsessed with a certain pleasure or sin we don't want to be oppressed we don't and we don't want to see other acquaintances or friends or relatives being possessed by an evil spirit. So Lord, help us to do spiritual battle every day because the battle is 24-7, 24-7. We thank you, Lord, because greater is you that lives in us than he that is commanding this evil system, the world. Thank you, Lord. Help us to believe it and to obey you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, and for his honor and glory only. Amen.